All right. The appointed hour of 6.30 having been reached, I call this meeting to order. My name is Steve Judge. As chair of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals, I welcome everybody to this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general chapter, law chapters 30A, section 18, and the governor's March 15th, 2020 order, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This public hearing of the town of Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but the public can listen to the proceedings by clicking on a link in the town's web page. In accordance with provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. We will begin with a roll call of the regular members of the ZBA who have been paneled for consideration of the items on, on tonight's agenda. I'm Steve Judge, I'm here. Mr. Langsdale? Here. Ms. O'Meara? Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Here. And associate ZBA members, Ms. Waldman? Here. Mr. Barrick? Mr. Greeny? And Mr. Meadows. Also in attendance is Maureen Pollock, planning planner, Christine Brestrup, planning director, Nate Malloy, senior planner, Dave Waskevich, building inspector, John Witten of KP Law Firm, and Rob Mora is also in attendance. And I see that uh, Ms. O'Meara is here as well. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 48 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. Each petition is heard by, heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board may seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raise hand function on their screen. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, present your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. I want to remind the applicant, my fellow board members and the public to seek recognition from the chair before speaking. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the, pub about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. The following is the statutory timeline for ZBA action on comprehensive permits. Within 40 days from the closing of a public hearing, the ZBA must render a decision that is deny, approve, or approve with conditions based on majority vote. Within 14 days of its decision, the ZBA must file a copy with the town clerk. And within 20 days from the date of the ZBA decision is filed with the town clerk, the public can appeal the ZBA's decision. I want to review the ways in which the public can be informed about and comment on this application in addition to these public hearings. Residents can sign up to be notified of any additional information recorded by the town concerning this application through the notify me feature on the town website. Copies of all submissions can be found on the town website. Go to the ZBA page, click on the link for 132 Northampton Road. That link will bring you to a page which allows you to navigate all the public information regarding this application. Public comments can be submitted on the 132 Northampton Road page or email to Maureen Pollock, planner at P-O-L-L-O-C-K-M at hammersma.gov. 
Amherst Media will not be broadcasting tonight's hearing. However, check their website for information on when it will be rebroadcast. Or you can view a recording of this meeting on the town's YouTube channel. Tonight's agenda is as follows. A public hearing to consider ZBA 2020-39, Valley Community Development Corporation, 132 Northampton Road, requests a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40B, to construct a new two and one half story residential multifamily building containing 28 small studio apartments and related common areas on an approximate 0.88 acre property located at 132 Northampton Road, map 14C, parcel eight, general residence RG and educational ED zoning districts. This meeting is continued from October 15th, 2020. Tonight's order of business is as follows. First, we'll have public comment. Secondly, we'll review and, and possibly approve findings. Next, we'll review and possibly approve waiver requests, review and possibly approve conditions, other items that ZBA chair deems appropriate, and then final deliberations regarding the application. There will be a general public comment period on items not the subject of this hearing tonight. Since the October 15th public hearing, the board has received the following submissions. A draft decision document from staff, including proposed findings, proposed waivers, and proposed conditions. A set of plans from the applicant entitled Revised Permit Plan Set dated 10-22-2020 a parking management plan from the applicant, comments from the applicant on the draft decision document, additional comments received from October, public comments received from October 15th until October 29th, Francis Goy's floor, floor comments submitted via email dated October 15th, 2020. Annie Burton, comments submitted via emails October 21st, anonymous comments, submitted via the town website, October 21st, anonymous photographs submitted via the town web <clears throat> website, October 21st, Steve George comments submitted, submitted via the town website, October 23rd, and Barbara Wilbur comments submitted via me memo dated October 28th. Let me just have one word about the order of tonight's business. We did not have time for public comment during our last public hearing. So that will be the first order of business tonight. After that, we are going to describe, discuss, and vote on pro proposed findings. At our September 15th meeting, every finding was read into the record. Changes from the findings reviewed by the board last week contained in the draft de decision documents are primarily technical, grammatical, or were accepted by the board on the 15th. I will break up the findings by broad subject matter, and we will discuss the vote on any amendments to the findings at that time. When we complete the review of the draft findings, we will consider a motion to approve the findings. We will follow the same procedure for consideration of waivers and then for conditions. Next, we will consider a motion to close the public hearing. If the board feels that they are ready to render a decision on the application tonight, the public hearing will be closed and we will open a public meeting. If we open the public meeting tonight, the board will consider and discuss a motion to approve the application for a comprehensive permit. Are there any questions regarding tonight's order of business? Okay, the first order of business is public comments um, on the comprehensive permit application. If you wish to speak, please use the raised hand function on your screen. The staff will unmute your microphone. Please give your name and address for the record. You will have about three minutes to make your statement. Remember to address your comments to the board. Maureen, do we have anybody who um, oh, yes. wants to comment? Uh, we have a, a KS.
Hi, Kaya. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I'm a neighbor to the developer. Please uh, state your name and your address. Thank you. I would prefer not to give my name or address, but I'm a close neighbor to the development. Um, I support this development to provide affordable housing and would like to thank the board for their careful review. I would like to ask the board to formally consider and vote on making this a smoke-free property. In doing so, I would like to ask them to consider the health impacts of smoking and the proximity of their planned smoking area to a smoke-free campus, an athletic facility, and a frequently used public space. The board did note two meetings ago that they would consider and vote on the possibility of making this smoke-free, taking into account the public comments that they've heard and the many other successful smoke-free developments across town. I hope that they will follow through on that tonight. Um, as a close neighbor, I personally feel that the health benefits of smoke-free development are clear and hope the board will vote in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um... Ms. Wilbur. Hi, thanks. Um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody had a moment to read the um, memo that I submitted with regards to the trees that line our property on the west side. We want those trees down. I appreciate for some that riding up the hill, it looks nice. Um, but as you can see from the pictures that I've included, the impact upon us as a butters. Um, I just realized I didn't say my name and where I was from. <laughs> you didn't catch me, Maureen. Um, Barbara Graven Wilbur, 126 Northampton Road, an immediate butter, a butter to the property. Um, the trees, the impact of the trees with the roots. I did learn something very interesting. And the reason the roots are growing into our property versus the property at 132 is because of the richness of our soil and the fact that we don't have a driveway and hard pack that is preventing them from going towards the west, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, that will just continue and give us headaches. So again, please read the note, look at the pictures, and if anybody wants to come and walk the backyard and see the impact, I'm happy to entertain them. Thanks very much. And I appreciate all the work the ZBA is doing. Um, and I hope those trees come down prior to the start of the construction because that makes the most sense. It doesn't make any sense to try and have to do it at a later date or to do it when it's going to be more expensive as well as incur more the possibility of increased damage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? No. All right. The next item on the agenda for tonight is consideration of draft findings. Maureen, we're gonna put the, um, the draft decision document on the website, right? So the, yes. we'll share uh, that. Yes. Uh, screen share uh, of that. Give me one second. Yep. I think it'll be easier for us to all work off that one document. Mr. Judge. Mr. Lansdale. Yep. Um, I feel a little strange about having the public comment right at the beginning. That's never happened before. So there may be people who want to comment who won't uh, come into this until later. I just feel like we have to at some point go back to public comment just, just to see if there's anybody who is uh, logged on. Um, well, we did, we did announce it or put it in the agenda that way. And I know it's not the normal process, but we, the reason we put it in the front is because I wanted to make sure that we had the public comment before we made our, did our made decisions or consideration of, uh, of the findings, the conditions and the application in general. So I wanted to make sure we had that rather than have it at the end. Um, we could do it, we could so do that, it later on. That, keep, keep, that, um, yeah, that I guess would, if we want to. 
That was stated where? It, oh, in the agenda, I think. My agenda. Didn't the, in the agenda that was set out, the Correct. first item is public comments? No. And I said at the, in, meeting, I said at the meeting last last week that we would do public comments first. I admit it's it's different than is normally done, but if we have it at the end, then we've gone through, we've made our decisions. And the public comment comes after we've made our decisions. No, it comes before we make our decision. Well, the final decisions, but we would have to have, we're going to vote on findings, we're going to vote on waivers, and we're going to vote on conditions, and then we're going to vote on the the app, the whole application, the comprehensive permit application of in one uh, one big package at the end. Okay, it's up to you, but I object. Well, we'll see if there's if there are other members of the public that do um, call in later and raise raise their hand, we can adjust it. But I suspect we won't see many. We will keep an eye out for it because I don't want to preclude anybody's um, ability to contribute to the, the consideration of this. All right. Um, okay, so, okay. Um, so let me share it, sorry. So I'm going to, uh, what, what you want, we'll start to review the draft finding. Yep. So just go up to the beginning here, uh, top of the page, where we, at background, yep. So this was, again, this was all read by me and by Mr. Langsdale into the record uh, last week or two weeks ago. Just I'm just going to review the, the most uh, important parts, highlight it, and try to identify any significant changes from that which was um, approved two weeks ago. The most important part of this is that in accordance in statement of relevant material facts and findings. In accordance with provisions of 760 CMR 56X SEC, during the opening, opening public hearing in this matter, the board informed the applicant that the town of Amherst is consist, consistent with local needs. The applicant did not challenge that. And the applicant um, that empowers the board to deny the project or in the alternative to approve the project with conditions and no appeal from the board's decision by the applicant lies within the housing appeals committee. If conditioned, the proposed project's benefits outweighs negative effects and will be consistent with the town's master plan and housing plan goal. Notwithstanding the town's status, after careful consideration of the record before it, the board members acknowledge and familiar familiarity with the locus and the surrounding neighborhoods and the benefits offered by the proposed project. The board has determined that the benefits of the proposed project outweigh any measurable impact and improve and approves the same provided the applicant or its successors or assigns complies with each of the conditions imposed herein. In reaching the con conclusion to approve the proposed project with the conditions set forth below, the board makes the following findings of fact. The ZBA finds that there is a need for housing of this type. This proposal is in harmony with the goals of the master plan to increase density in an already developed area. There are several criteria for the needs for this housing were identified from the housing and needs assessment, the housing production plan, and the comprehensive market study. Amherst vacancy rate is below 2%. Approximately 4,000 or 56% of Amherst households are paying too much for their housing. The housing production plan determined there is an estimated deficit of 2,475 rental units for those earning below 50%. According to the Amherst Housing Authority, over 1,358 applicants are on a wait list for one bedroom units. According to the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, the proposed project addresses the housing needs of the extremely low and moderate income housing. The management plan assures the tenants will have voluntary access to a variety of social and health services they may need for either on site or through referrals. US, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development has found that 55% of the households, 4,900 out of 8,900 in Amherst are low income with 26% of Amherst households, extremely low income, 14% 
very low income, 15% low income. Due to the very low vacancy rate in single occupancy units in Amherst, particularly for lower rent units and the ongoing pressure on the local housing market by many students in the area seeking off-campus housing, the board concludes that there is a well-documented and continuing local and regional need for additional low and moderate income housing that exists in the town of Amherst. In addition, as conditioned below, the board makes the following additional findings of fact. The proposed project will protect and advance the health and safety of the residents of the proposed housing site by providing safe pedestrian access. Rental units will be accessible to the mobility impaired. The project does not create an undue burden on the public schools. And there's adequate fire protection and other public safety measures. The proposed project will not threaten the natural environment. The applicant will provide energy efficiency and low carbon footprints. Develop is development is located in a pedestrian friendly location. The design and construction of the stormwater sewer will comply with stormwater best management practices. The proposed project promotes acceptable site building and design in relation to the surrounding and municipal regional planning and or preserving open space uses. The project meets several objectives and strategies of the town's master plan. But preserving and expanding the number of affordable units, creating incentives to make it financially attractive for developers to build affordable housing, partner with the Amherst Housing Authority and local community development corporations, nonprofit agencies, and other groups expanding affordable housing in Amherst, improving housing and services for people in the area who are homeless, and increase the amount of housing available to people of very low income. Adjacent properties will be protected from the, from the project specifically from the intrusion of various types of nuisances through screening, uh, minimal traffic impact, the provision of a residential services co coordinator and part-time on-site property management and a 24 seven emergency call number, stormwater runoff uh, management on the site, exterior lighting will be designed and installed, dark downlit and dark sky compliant, and tracks and trash and recycling will be stored within a screened dumpster area. Those are the findings. So I would think um, this would be the time for any discussion, any amendment to the findings, and then if we if we um, agree to vote on uh, adoption of the findings. Is there any discussion on the findings? Uh, Mr. Chair. Oh, Mr. Maxfield, didn't see your sign, your hand. Oh, um, hi. Hey, how are you? I, uh, for the, the, the part about um, making sure that the findings are that this isn't a nuisance to adjacent properties. I know we had the, the one public comment about potentially making the smoke free. Um, do we, as a board, believe that if we were to make it smoke free and that would then cause people to go out onto Route 9 and smoke uh, on the sidewalk, would we say that would be consistent with, with not making this project a nuisance? Well, I think the discussion about smoke free or not is probably more appropriate in the conditions section okay. rather, than yeah. in the, rather than in the findings. But okay. I think the findings, either way, um, there are the findings that there are lots of measures being made to reduce the nuisance to them to um, neighbors and the immediate neighborhood. Um, one of those is smoking, but it's also screening and that there are other kinds of things and, and, and uh, not having um, obvious mechanical devices and um, not having uh, blasting during Saturdays and giving notice and all the other kinds of things that are done in conditions. 
And so that one specifically, I would, I would prefer to deal with during conditions. And we will come to that later on. No, I, I agree, Mr. Chair. Thank you. You bet. Any other questions about findings? These are important because this really is the, is the, uh, the foundation for our, our next two actions, which are dealing with waivers and dealing with conditions and then approval or disapproval of the, of the project application. So unless there are any other questions or other discussions, I would move that the draft findings contained in the draft decision document be adopted by a board, the board. Do I have a second? Seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? If there is no discussion, the question occurs on the motion to approve the draft findings. This is a roll call vote requiring a majority or three votes to prevail. I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. The vote is five ayes, zero nays, and the motion is approved. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of waiver requests. And I think Maureen, probably the best thing to do there would be to bring up the um, waiver chart that we have. Give me one second. Sure. While you find it, I'll just uh, remind board members and the public that we read through each of the um, waivers. There was some discussion about some of these waivers, which we have that those changes and modifications have been incorporated in this latest document that you that you were given by Maureen. Um, but there are not very many changes from that which was read into the record fully last week or two weeks ago. There we go. All right. So I'm going to quickly go through this, and I don't think we need to break these up into sections because I think they're for the most part pretty non-controversial, but I, we will have time at the end of just describing these for discussion, amendment, and approval or, or disapproval. So the first one is um, educational uses. There's a minor, there's a minor mapping discrepancy. Secondly, uh, number of units in the building, we're waiving the, the, uh, the limit to, to allow 28 units. A special permit is required in the R. We're waiving the requirement for a special permit because we're granting a comprehensive permit. 5.00 general accessory units. Again, we're waiving the requirement for a special permit because we have a comprehensive permit. There's a requirement, uh, a limitation on the maximum percentage of units of one type. We're going to grant a waiver to this because the purpose of the of it right of this is to allow um, a building made up solely of um, um, efficiency units. It's 3.323 um, allows a apartment to be built in a, in a specific location, heavily traveled street next to educational district in an area of mix of single family, multifamily homes. We're waiving the requirement for design review requirements. We're, we're allowing um, the quantities of cut and fill as shown on the plans to be done without a special permit because we're granting a comprehensive permit. Um, additional lot area, we're granting a waiver from the additional lot area per family because it would be not be feasible if we did not waive that. Article six, table three, maximum lot coverage, we're waiving uh, the waiver allowing a higher lot coverage for the proposed uh, uh, development. We're granting, we would grant waivers for the side yard from certain side yard requirements. The same thing, we're granting waivers from year yard, rear yard requirements. We're also granting a waiver to up to eight feet for the fence, a waiver for the fence setback, a waiver for the number of parking spaces to allow 16 as opposed to two per unit. We're allowing up to 50, we're granting a waiver to allow 50% of proposed parking spaces to be compact spaces. 
we're allow granting a waiver to allow the parking area to be landscaped as shown in the plan, which includes pavers and other kind of, as well as um, 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 bituminous covered parking areas. We're granting a waiver on driveway length with the approval of the fire vehicle of the fire department. We're granting a waiver for uh, separately engineered plans for the driveway. We're granting two waivers for sign requirements for the temporary signs. We're granting a waiver um, to allow the, the permitting, permitting body can uh, grant a waiver on the traffic impact report. We've deemed this, the, the report that we've received sufficient. We're granting a waiver on the separate site plan review. Article 13 granting a waiver on a demolition delay um, inconsistent with the uh, historical commission's recommendation. We're granting a waiver on two waivers on inclusionary zoning. This is what requires low income, uh, the provision of low income housing and this entire project is low income housing and complies with the one section of the inclusionary zoning requirement. We're also uh, requiring, uh, providing a waiver for landscape guidelines including requiring a separate tree warden approval he's looked at the property does not need, feel he needs to to um he doesn't have much to say about it and uh, not a lot on town land uh, and also the sewer and water connections are granting a waiver for separate de departmental approval because it's part of the comprehensive permit again and lastly we're allowing uh waivers to requirements in local bylaws and regulations related to the dimensional and use requirements to the excess necessary to build the project as presented on plans and any subsequent final plan that may be subject to permitting authority approval. Are there any questions regarding the waivers? If there are no questions, no further questions, regarding waivers um, and no further discussion. Mr. Judge, Mr. Chair, yes. Yes. Uh, Ms. O'Mara has a comment. Oh, I didn't see, it's so hard with this smaller screen to pick up the, the raised hands. I'm sorry, Ms. O'Mara. No, I just raised it. <laughs> um, so if we don't agree with some of the waivers, how do we propose that? We could, you could propose to um, delete that waiver. It would be one way or propose to amend that waiver, either one. Ms. O'Mara, which so, one are you concerned about? Uh, the eight foot fence. Mm -hmm. So that's the uh, 6.24. Uh, correct. All right. Um, what, what question do you want to place before the board? to amend that or to um, delete it? Um, well, I'm challenging the, the equivalency or however I want to say with fence height to demolition of the trees. It seems like they're one in hand and I mm -hmm. oppose and I object to the demolition of the trees. And I don't think the eight foot fence is an appropriate replacement. Okay, so um, we will have a chance to vote on the eight foot trees, but if we already grant a waiver for the fence, it wouldn't mean much. I mean, those, these are kind of inextricably linked together. Uh, I can, you know, is, I would suspect your argument, right? Correct. So um, this se seems a case that we should deal with that. We should deal with that issue and see where the board is on on ha allowing an eight foot fence and have that discussion. So I would suggest the best way to deal with your, to pose your question to the board is to move to um, delete the waiver for 6.2 forward. And then we can have a discussion about it and we can vote on that motion to delete that waiver. Does that make sense for you? It does. Okay. So then I would say that Ms. O'Meara moves to delete sec uh, waiver for section 6.24. Um, does she have a second? Well, 
Well, I'll give you a, I'll give you a second in order so you can make your case, but I don't want that to be indicative of how I feel about the, the vote, Ms. O'Meara. So I want to give you a chance to make your case to the board on that article, which is really about the trees and the fence. <laughs> I think we've gone over this several weeks already. Yeah. Uh, I object to the trees coming down. I don't know why it's coming up now uh, for the ZBA to decide on this. Why wasn't this done 20 years ago uh, for the abutters? I don't get why this project has to absorb the, core, the cost of demolishing all those trees. Environmentally, I don't think it's a good idea. Aesthetically, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't, I know I don't have a lot of backing for this issue, but I will still maintain my point of view. Thank you. Sure. Is there any other uh, discussion on the motion? Mr. Maxfield. I mean, I, I suppose I'll just, you know, make the case here in, in, in favor of removing the trees here. Um, the, the abutter wants them gone. The, uh, the applicant is applying to have them gone. They want this eight foot, um, eight foot fence put there in its place. Why is it coming to the ZBA? You know, I don't have an answer to that question, but, but it is, and, and both parties here want them removed. So my point of view here is nobody but us seems to be the ones who would be objecting here. So I'm in favor of removing those trees as both parties want them gone. Ms. O'Meara. Thank you. I just feel like we're being bullied right now by the abutters. That's my point of view. This could have come up 20 years ago when they were, had those trees growing there. Why is it on the burden of the developer to get those trees down? I don't agree with that cost. And I don't agree with the environmental impact. Any further comments? Ms. Parks. Um, I, I will say that I also had a concern about the trees and uh, you know, for me personally, I would like to see the trees stay, but I am also um, convinced that for the abutters that this is important and for uh, Valley CDC, they're willing to do that. And so because of those things, I think that uh, I, I am okay with those trees being taken down and the eight foot fence, but I, I am sorry to see those trees go. I have, um, I have much the same concerns. Uh, I don't like to see the trees go either, but I think that you, they, if they come down in the future, it's gonna be either be more expensive for Valley. Um, I, we didn't, I don't think we got a, um, um, a naturalist to take a look at them, an arborist to take a look at them over the last two weeks to tell us how healthy they are. But at some point those trees come down. And um, in a $7 million project, I think the tree, tree removal is a small part um, but it is, it is some cost, but it's a small cost. And I think if we have the, the abutter who's willing to um, accept the project with that as one of the conditions, I think it's a, a worthwhile offering to the town. Any other comments from board members? Ms. Baker? Um, to Ms. O'Meara's point, I think w the reason they didn't come down 20 years ago is it wasn't understood that they were on the property line. I think they were planted by the Keaties, who were the previous owners of 132 Northampton Road, um, very near the property line, and then they grew. And so when we had our survey done about a year and a half, two years ago, I think the abutters were taken aback, surprised that they had a share in these trees at all. I think they assumed they didn't have any control over them. And so I think it evolved um, that they grew on to actually the property line. Um, and so it becomes, they become what's referred to as line trees, um, which do require per, you know, approval of both parties um, for them to be taken down. Any other comments from members of the board? Uh, yeah. Mr. Langsdale? 
Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, Miss Baker, I, just because I don't remember, um, the cost of bringing the trees down, is that to be shared between you and the abutters? No, that's not our intention. Okay. Our intention is that it would be part of the project cost um, along with the fencing and the screening plantings. Um, you know, as part of an accommodation to someone who's going to live next to a changed um, circumstance. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I think most members have expressed their opinion. Um, unless there's any further discussion, the vote occurs on the motion by Ms. O'Meara to delete. Um, 6.24, the waiver of 6.24. Uh, this is a roll call vote requiring three votes to delete the requirement. I vote nay, Mr. Langsdale. Nay. Say it again, nay or a? A. A. N -A. Why? N A, okay. Uh, Mr. I, Chair. I, Yes. Sorry, it looks like Valley CD. I don't know if it's Laura or someone else from Valley CDC, but someone just raised their hand. Well, we're in the middle of a vote. Yeah, so sorry. We're okay. going to keep going. That's okay. okay. Um, so I vote nay. Mr. Langsdale votes nay. Miss O'Meara. Nay. She votes aye. Miss Parks. Nay. Mr. Maxfield. Nay. The vote is. Uh, one I and four nays. Um, the waiver request, the motion to delete the waiver request is not approved. Are there any other amendments or conditions, uh, amendments or um, discussion about the waivers? Hearing none, the vote occurs on, uh, I make a motion that we approve the waivers as um, in the draft decision document that we have before us. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion on the motion to approve the waiver requests? If not, this is a roll call. The question occurs on the motion to approve the draft waiver requests this is a roll call vote requiring a majority or three votes to prevail. I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. O'Meara? Nay. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. The vote is four ayes and one nay. And the motion to approve the um, waiver request passes. The next item on the agenda is consideration of draft conditions. Now we've got a lot of, again, like, um, like the waiver requests and the findings, we, and with the uh, really much appreciated help of uh, the velvet tones of Mr. Langsdale, um, the pear-shaped tones of Mr. Langsdale last meeting, we went through each of these. We um, read them each into the, to the record. And so I'm not gonna do that again. And what I propose to do is summarize them in groups. So the first group would be from, from um, item number one through item number 11, which are just general, um, general provisions. And then we can discuss, amend, and move on uh, for, each, for each of the um, conditions. So the first 11 conditions. The total number of dwelling units uh, is limited to 28. We've been through all that. We've, this is the general restrictions on the number of units and who shall be, uh, who shall be eligible uh, from, income, from an income standpoint for each of the units. There's a regulatory agreement required that ensures the preservation of the above noted affordability requirements. Um, the town is gonna to be made party to that regulatory agreement. That answers some of the questions we had about what happens if there should be um, um, financial problems with the sponsor or the applicant. Um, there are some conditions regarding communication, you know, standard conditions regarding communication with the town when certain actions take place. Um, there is a condition number five that deals with uh, certification and included in that condition is response to some of the 
questions raised by board members that the applicant agrees to is required to work with tenants whose income has increased that's contained in uh, has increased that's contained in um, condition number five um, there are um, there's protection for the town that allows us to the authority continue to have the authority to enforce the provisions of the, of the comprehensive permit there's a 70 percent local preference for units in the initial lease up contained in uh, condition nine condition 10 and 11 require a development of a marketing plan and a final approval from the subsidizing agency uh, and shall be given to the building commissioner for final approval that's the first 11 conditions. Um, is there any discussion, questions, or amendments to the first 11 conditions? I understand, Ms. Laura, Ms. Baker, you have some um, questions about some of these conditions that have not been raised with the staff before, or, or conditions or questions that you raised but were not included in the draft document is that it it is All so right. we had we had submitted comments but just the sequencing was a little out of order so i don't think these are major items but on item number nine which is the business about the local preference we had asked for a sentence to be added saying that the applicant shall only be responsible for implementing local preference to the extent it is approved by the subsidizing agency following requests made by the town. Basically, we can't unilaterally implement it without approval of the subsidizing agency. And what, why is that, why is your language needed when in within number nine, it says the local preference shall comply with procedures approved by the subsidizing agency? I mean, it says to me, there, to, that, to that me, you can't, you, we, if they don't approve it, if they don't allow it, then you can't do it. And we acknowledge that. In to me, that already. says that we'll follow their protocols as we implement the local preference. But if they don't approve the local preference. Right, we can't follow you, then, their procedures. And then the local preference, you wouldn't be complying if you had a local preference. So you'd have to you'd comply with local preference by not offering it. I mean, that's the, okay. it's, it's, I mean, it's clear here to me, it's clear here to me that if, you, if, um, is it D, who is it, DHCD? Yes. If DHCD rejects the local preference that the town and you have applied for, that you're not going to be required to have a local preference. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions, comments, or amendments to conditions one through 11? We'll move to B then. B would be through, uh, through condition 21. Most of these are really um, procedural regarding town and water sewer hookups. Um, who is responsible for obtaining relevant approvals. Um, the, the one that there's a comment on regards the fees. Uh, there was some concern that we are locking in fees that may, um, may um, reduce the flexibility of the town to increase fees or charge more in the end. I think staff has talked to is a DPW about the likelihood of fee increases during the, the time of construction. And we found that it's, unlikely or that there's no plans to increase fees. And so we're not locking ourselves out of potential fee increases. Is that right, Maureen? Uh, correct. So I, I spoke to the DPW Superintendent Guilford Mooring last Friday about the, the language of condition 15 uh, regarding the fees. And he uh, stated that uh, he is not anticipating increasing fees uh, in in the next uh, two to five years. So he said he's comfortable with the condition as, as written. Okay. 
there's a requirement for CAD plans for um, easements, lines, um, and pins and utilities. Uh, requirement that before building permit, the applicant shall submit an operation maintenance plan for the stormwater management. Um, all utilities shall be underground. I, I have just one question about that. And the, uh, that the project completed, shall be completed and dwelling units made available within 24 months. I know that's a time that we anticipated last week, and I wonder if the applicant is still comfortable with that 24 month time frame. Is that too short or is that um, Ms. Ms. Baker? Sure, so we had actually proposed um, just a little more specific language. Um, completion, construction shall be completed within actually 20 months from the issuance of the notice to proceed to the general contractor until the temporary certificate of occupancy is issued. Just because construction, the construction period was didn't seem well defined. Mr. Mora um, or Mr. Waskevich, is that acceptable to you, or is is what's contained in this standard operating procedure, and you'd rather have the uh, number uh, as have it remain as drafted? Uh, uh, this is Rob Mora. I don't have any concerns yeah. about the proposed language, uh, as long as the, the board's intent is to have a project come to its substantial completion uh, once it's started. And that language seems to do that if the board found that acceptable. So Ms. Baker, can you, do you have specific language that you no. want to offer to us yeah, tonight? Yeah, I, I do. Okay, and what would it, how would it read? Construction shall be completed within 20 months from issuance of the notice to proceed to the general contractor until the temporary certificate of occupancy is issued. Do you have that, Maureen? Correct, yes, and, and Laura did uh, provide that, um, provide her comments in a email um, that I, I actually did send over just two days ago. Uh, so anyways, I do have that that language. Okay. Um, well, uh, that's, so I propose, oh, Mr. Langsdale, go ahead. Uh, I, I just wanna ask, I, yep. I know you're concerned about time, but you're really skipping through this. I have no idea which one of these you were just talking about in terms of that language. I'm going back sure. and forth with these pages and I can't find it. So, uh, so I should have told you it's, it's number 21. Okay. That we were just talking about where we last week talked about a, um, a time frame in which to complete this. And we- I, I'm, I'm just asking, I'm asking because the, anyone who from the public may not have this or, or may not have read this, uh, so as you tend to skip through these things, if you could just let us know where you are as you're skipping through. So we have numbers. What's being, what's being talked about. I can give you some, I'll give numbers of conditions. That'd be helpful. Yeah, thank you. So for number 21, um, I move that we accept the, that we amend number 21 as per the language offered by um, that, that Maureen has from the applicant. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion about that amendment? Ms. Parks. Can, can I just hear it one more time? Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. I'll say it. Um, construction completion, so sorry, construction shall be completed within 24, sorry, Oh, construction shall be completed within 20 months from issuance of the notice to proceed to the general contractor until the temporary certificate of occupancy is issued. Would it be helpful, Maureen, can you type that up on that page? In, you know what, like I'm in, gonna- In blue or something? Uh, if you bear with me for one second, I am just going to open Laura's, Laura's, um, Laura's uh, document of suggested comments. So bear with me for one moment. Right. Okay. 
it's um, condition. Hold on a second. Mr. Judge. Yes, Mr. Langsdale. I think even if she opens that and we look at what uh, Ms. Baker said, we then need to know exactly how this is going to read before we can say yes or no to it. Yep. But I think when we see it, we'll know where it can go in the uh, in the condition. So I'm just going to highlight. Um, so, uh, so Laura, can you repeat it? Construction shall be completed within 20 months from issuance of the notice to proceed to the general contractor until the temporary certificate of occupancy is issued. So the general contractor gets a notice that he may proceed. You have yep. 20 months to complete, you have 20 months to complete the um, the construction and then you go for a uh, 20 months not only to complete the construction but to get a temporary certificate of occupancy is that right. correct yeah so just sometimes there's a gap between when the building permit issues and when we actually start construction could be depending on a, a legal matter closing time of year so the real clock starts ticking in terms of physical construction when we issue a notice to proceed and the temporary certificate of occupancy means people can move in. So the building is that ready that people are allowed to move into it. And notice to there's no construction activity that, tell me if I'm wrong. This is a, a question, should be said as a question. Is there any ability for any construction activity to take place prior to a note, notice to proceed the general contractor? Um, not not contractually between the owner and the contractor. They can only start after we give them a notice to proceed. Okay. Does that- Mr. Mr. Langsdale? Does that include the removal of the trees? It includes any work on the site. Okay. So you got 20 months to do the work. Well, okay, <laughs> let's go back. Does that also include the demolition of the house that's there? Yep. Okay, well, this says construction shall be completed. Sh should there be anything about um, the uh, demolition of the house and the trees? You know, I, 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 I don't think you need the demolition because they can't do the construction without the demolition. So it's almost, you can't have the, you can't have construction without the demolishment. Um, the trees you could do without, I guess, um, but you can't do anything. That, as this is understood, you can't do anything that's on the plan. You can't you can't touch anything until you, you get, get a, notice, to a proceed. notice to proceed. Let me just ask Mr. Mora if that's correct. Is there some de minimis work that can be done, or is there like nothing can happen until um, you get a an issuance of the notice to proceed? Well, I mean, that's really, you know, a, a, a contract question between the owner and the contractor and what their scope of services includes. Generally, that's the case. So a, a, a general contractor that has the full scope of work from demolition to site work, tree removal through construction to certificate of occupancy wouldn't be doing anything until they have the notice to proceed. Um, so if we I'm, want to lock this down, we would we could say something to the effect that construction, neither construction nor um, landscape landscape preparation shall take shall. Um, oh, how do you do that? Add that into that language, Mr. Judge. I, I expect that Ms. Hardy has got a suggestion for me. Uh, if uh, I I do, yep. Um, yep. you might insert a parenthetical after the word construction to say including any site work. Yeah. So it would be construction parenthesis, open parenthesis, including any site work, close parenthesis, close, close parenthesis. And I think that that would take care of Mr. Langsdale's concern. Okay. Ms. Parks. Um, just because I don't understand. So where does the notice to proceed come from? Who issues that? So uh, this is, to Ms. me, Baker? this is a, 
this is such, this is a very minor issue. I'm happy to go back to the town's original language. We didn't know how much time you were gonna fill in where those X's were. So we made our own suggestion. If you wanna leave it the way that you had it and have the 24 months, I think it's probably fine also. Okay, but who does, who, who issues a notice to proceed? That comes from you to the general contractor, yes, correct? correct. Okay, I, I guess the reason I was bringing it up is because in 21, it says, within 24 months from the date that this decision becomes final. And I guess I feel like that's coming from us, whereas the issuance of notice to proceed, could, could that happen a year, a year from now? In other, in other words, 24 months from the decision to me is set in time. Whereas this one, I, it's what's missing for me is, in relation to the decision. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you're, and what I think th they're saying is that the relevant limitation on the relevant time when they can work is not dependent on when the decision is made, but it has to start at some later point when the weather is right or other, other factors could impinge upon that. And they want to have 20 months in which to, to do site work and construction from some date. And I guess the only thing we could do is say that you, you know, some kind of overarching, you know, 24, 26 months, everything has from the date of, of um, approval uh, or some other trigger to try to keep them in. Uh, so that it doesn't go on for three years or something is, is I think your concern is that you want to have it for a period of time and not go on forever, right, Ms. Sparks? That's, I, that's my the only yep. concern is that when I you know when I'm reading the new language, it's feeling like the there's more more time can pass. So yeah, I. But I also think they're driven by economics to try to get it done as quickly right. as possible too. So that's the market forces that I think would drive that. Okay. All right. Let's one last comment on this, and then we should move on, Ms. Baker. Ms. Parks was talking about two different things. So there's a period of time between the issuance of the zoning permit and when construction can start. And typically that's a three-year window. Um, and then there's a different, this is specifying how long are we making noise and doing construction on the site. And I'm totally happy to yield back to the way that it was before. The 24 months is sufficient. Again, we, we, we were asked how much time we, we thought we needed. And so we provided this, but 24 months from building permit to completion, substantial completion is also fine language, but it doesn't mean we're gonna start building within 20 or 24 months. That's an entirely different question. Okay, so the applicant is happy with, tw with con uh, condition 21 as stated in the draft condition. If, unless members of the board want to deal with that question and want to amend that, um, I'm willing to withdraw my amendment, my, my motion to amend number 21. I don't think, I think that protects us. I think what's there protects the town now. Town officials are happy with it. They drafted oh. this. What, now what? I'm, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> This is something really different than it used to say. So number 21 says the project approved here and shall be completed and all dwelling units made available for occupancy within 24 months from the date this decision becomes final. That That's... would never happen. <laughs> so okay. typically zone, I've seen zoning decisions that have a three year window where you have to begin construction within three years. And then the previous draft of this talked about how long of a construction period we would have. And somewhere along the way, it's changed into something that's quite different. Um, okay, so we have before us the question of the, the language proposed by the amendment that I have on the table, which is the language that you saw um, 
written, put on the conditions by Maureen, the language, oops, it's gone. Oh, can you see my screen now? Yep, can see your screen, but I see. Um, so this was. A different plan. So uh, Maureen, yeah, this is a different condition and different numbered. So uh, th this was how this uh, condition that we're talking about boat construction was written as of Friday. Um, I, I believe attorney Witten um, revised the this condition um, as you saw momentarily. So th this is what the board had. Um, this was what the, what the board was contemplating at the last meeting. Um, and, 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 at that, and then at that time, we put in XX um, as we were kind of just wondering, what, well, how many months uh, would make sense? So would the board be agreeable to uh, the condition as written here? And as you yeah, see it before us, and then would have to be some time of type of the length of time that this could reasonably done, be done in. And that would have to be, it sounds like 36 months. Is that right? No, I mean, we typically have a zoning permit usually lasts for two or three years. You have so, you two know, or three is... years to start the work. Felicity, can this... you weigh in on this? Yeah, th yes, that, but Mr. Chairman. Just a, just a second, um, Ms. Ms. Hardy. Mr. Mora or, or Mr. Waskevich, you have to Dave, deal with this all the time. Dave, can you um, try to yeah. tell us what your, I, what your preference is for doing on. this? Can you hear me? It's Dave yep, Waskevich. now we can. Yeah, um, so oftentimes there's a starting point. It could be tied to the building permit issuance, for instance. I think you need some starting point because just 24 months from, from what? You need yep. some somewhere to start. Um, there's going to be a time period, uh, at least for construction. Where you know, once you uh, go through this uh, special permit, and uh, it'll be uh, a, a, a time period that it could be appealed, and then it becomes law, and then it gets filed with the registry. Um, so then the contractor will come in, and he'll file his building permit. We'll need some time to review it, um, unless we can get some preview of it. Um, but, you know, we have 30 days to do that. So I think it makes sense to start from the time that the building permit is issued. He'll have, or they will have 24 months until the completion um, from that time frame. Um, but the other thing that's also been mentioned is oftentimes in the past, um, boards have wanted a project to start, say, within 24 months or be substantially complete. So there's many different ways to look at mm -hmm. this. So that is also something to consider. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to point out that uh, as you can see uh, this condition, which reads uh, completion of construction shall be completed within um, so many months from the issuance of the building permit. That is typically how the board has been writing conditions for other projects. Yeah. Um, opposed to um, the other other um, draft, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Whitten. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good good evening, members of the board. So the the comprehensive permit under the relevant regulations is good for three years, but that doesn't speak to the construction period. So uh, paragraph twenty three uh, is, as Maureen said, a very traditional and typical paragraph. Uh, if the applicant believes that 24 months is not sufficient, then certainly the board could extend that, consider uh, an extension right now and make it 36 months or whatever the board feels comfortable. But the reason to put the closure of the construction period is to force the applicant uh, to expedite construction. So that is the basic rationale for why the board would not want an open-ended construction period. And obviously the applicant doesn't want that either, uh, but you may be dealing with another applicant, you know, you just never know. So putting a time frame on when construction shall be completed is a good practice. Mm -hmm. uh, the applicant can always come in and ask for a subsequent extension if the market uh, demands it or for any, any legitimate reason. So I, I, I would urge the board to keep 
paragraph 23 in, uh, choose the period that is uh, acceptable to the board. Ms. Hardy, response? Uh, Mr. Judge, we don't have a problem whatsoever with a construction period that's tied to the issuance of the building permit. The problem is, and so the, the language in, in section 23 as shown on the screen by Maureen now, we can put in 20 months or 24 months from the issuance of the building permit, that's fine. I think the point that Ms. Baker was making was that there is a period of time between the issuance of the decision and the time when we will be prepared to start the project because there is a fairly lengthy period that will um, follow the issuance of the decision while we complete the financing process. So the, this whole process is going to take a while. We don't have a problem with a construction period as long as it's tied to the issuance of the building permit because we won't be in a position to apply for the building permit until we get the financing that we need in order con to construct it. Okay, so you do have, you need X amount of months from the issuance of the building permit. Let's lock down one thing first, and then we can move to, if we need to do anything else. How many months is realistic for the issue, for construction within the issuance of the building permit? Ms. Baker. I think 24 months is fine. All right. Put 24 months up there, if you would. Okay, and then, then do we need to, I don't know if we need to say anything about the time between decision that we make and when the and when the uh, building permit is issued, because that is going to be controlled by the applicant. You're going to work as, and then you you will apply for the building permit. So you, will, I'm assuming that you will try to work as fast as possible to get that building permit as done, so you can get on get on with it, right? And so your financing doesn't lapse and everything else. You don't wanna lose your subsidies. Is there any reason that you would, do you need to have that time between the permit and between our decision and the, and the um, issuance of a building permit restricted or narrowed or limited? You need nothing. Is there any reason the public would need to have that time restricted or narrowed? I can't think of any reason, except we want to make sure that you do it. Mr. Langsdale, I see that you had a, you did have your hand raised. Yeah, yeah two, two things. Uh, one, uh, 23 as it reads now, Maureen, I think you can just cut the completion of at the beginning. It's redundant. Completion of construction shall be completed. <laughs> it's just construction shall be completed. But the other thing I think that is important is that if it takes them two or three years because of get, uh, uh, finalizing financing before they get the building permit. I think it's important that this, the idea of that nothing can be done on the property until the issuing of the building permit so that there's not, mm -hmm. like if, if they were to do some work and then it would all fall through, then the, the property has been damaged. Um, I, it seems to me that that should be part of the uh, equation before the issuance of the building permit. Because if it takes two or three years for this to get the building permit, uh, we don't want anything to happen to the property before then. Just reading through, see if that it's addressed in any other any other condition or in normal operation of the town. Can anything be done on the property before the issuance of the building permit? Mr. Westgevitz is raising his hand. Yeah, Mr. Westgevitz. I can't see your hand there very well, David. If you could <laughs> put it in the middle of the screen. There you go. Then I can see you. Yeah, I, uh, Attorney Witten had touched on there's a three-year window, and I don't know if that's something that um, 
should have a condition that you have to act or is that's just because of law they need to act within three years yeah that's a regulatory requirement so the board could put that in as a condition uh, but it doesn't have to and uh, generally speaking once once an applicant receives financing we we have never seen a lapse of of a permit um so no i i'm comfortable not including that unless the board wanted to choose a shorter time frame, which it could because the board is consistent with local needs. But, but again, my sense for this project is it wouldn't be appropriate. All right. So I guess the one question I did have though, Mr. Waskevich, can they go in and cut down trees without a building permit? That's, that's really what this comes to, or can they yeah. rip up the, the lawn and have all the, and have, um, stormwater and uh, other kind of drainage issues created in the time before the building permit is issued. Anything Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman yeah. the, answer, to, yes. the, the answer is no. The answer is no the way the, the draft decision is written. So okay. there, there, there are a lot of conditions precedent to site clearing uh, built into the decision. So I, yeah. David, I didn't, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I didn't mean to talk over you, um, but so That's that- okay. it, that is up to the board. The board can tighten those if they choose, but the way it's drafted now, uh, no, they couldn't, if the board were to vote tonight, for example, uh, the, uh, the applicant could not go in and clear cut the site um, subject until they met the conditions that are subject to this comprehensive permit. Okay. All right. So what I would like to do then is we seem to, unless there's other discussion regarding this this um, amendment, I would like to amend my amendment by saying to amend in on the draft decision, it's number 21. We're looking at number 23 here. Amend number 21 on the draft decision as we see 23 on the white page <laughs> before us uh, to the conditions. So if that makes sense, so that condition will then, number 21 will then read Completion of construction shall be uh, construction shall be completed. We'll take out completion of construction shall be completed within 24 months from the issuance of a building permit. Did you want to include uh, this um, this verbiage here, including site work, or no? I don't think we need. I I don't think we need that. We can't do anything okay. on that area. So. The motion is to amend number 21 to read, take delete completion of construction shall be completed within 24 months from the issuance of the building permit. Do I have a second? Second. Um, any further discussion? I have a question. Ms. Parks, yep. Um, so what happens if construction um, doesn't happen within three years? They lose the comprehensive permit. Okay. So there's not, could they come, could they ask for an extension if? Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. they can come back. And we've had in the past, we've had special permits. I don't know about comprehensive permits, but we've mm -hmm. had in the past people who've had trouble with uh, um, financing or something have come in and asked for an additional time. So that's been done before, but it doesn't happen very often. All right, quick one question. last comment. Yes, Mr. Langsdale. Um, on what I have in front of me, this written stuff, it's uh, condition 21. On the screen, it's yes. condition 23. How did we get up to two more? What, what's been added that makes this condition 23? This is what Maureen explained. This is what you see, the red that you were received in the mail and the one that we had, or you received on your property and the one that we had on the screen is the draft decision document. Which well, you all what is have. Uh, you yep. have both the, you, you have the draft decision. Um, it should be the last pack, uh, last like stapled um, information in your packet that was given to you. So if you go to condition one of this, um, of this draft decision, um, attorney Witten added this first condition. Uh, the project shall be constructed in strict conformance with the project plans. 
Yeah, right. that's there. And that wasn't in, in the um, other copy that was added. The one I've got is the one that it's all in red. Yep. And it, ha it has the number one mm -hmm. project shall be constructed in strict compliance. And still, when we get to where we are now, it's number 21, not 23. So there are two more that have been added somewhere. I don't know where they've been added. That's what I'm asking. Yes. So, uh, We're not but we are operating off the red. So what you're asking is what's what's changed between what was the white document? No, no. I'm asking. Okay, let me do this again. I've got the red document. You see? Yeah, we all do. And it says, okay. number one, the project shall be constructed in constrict conformance. Right. Which means when we get to where we're talking about now, we're at, on this, the red document, it says sec 21. On screen, it says 23. I'm asking what two conditions were added to make this 23 instead of 21, which is what it is on this. The one on the one on screen is. I guess we need to know what document is on the screen, Maureen. Are you, what you're seeing in front of you is the draft decision. So. Can I? But make that's what I. But that's what this is. This is the draft decision, correct? The, the red. Uh, yeah, and there's yeah. a there is uh, if you look at your um, header, what does it say, Keith? Does it say draft comprehensive permit? Yes. Then there you go. And, and there I go. What? What does that mean? That is the permit. That is the, the draft decision. So. And that is what is in front of you on the screen. Okay. Somebody, can somebody else so, explain this to me? I don't know what's yes. going on here. Can I make a suggestion? Go ahead. Please, Ms. Parks. Okay, Maureen, can you copy 23 off of this page, move this page away, go back to the red one and add this and update 21 to have this language that you just put here? Because this is an older document, the one that you have right. now, right? And we'd so, so, so what is in front of you that is the, um, that was provided by attorney, Witten that is dated revised date October 25th, 2020 is the most up to date document that the board should be looking at and that I'm sharing on the screen. That's not what's on the screen. Yeah, the what's on the screen is is the draft document dated the 23rd and I'm just suggesting oh, maybe maybe I'm not sure maybe I am showing maybe this is a zoom issue. Is this what you there. see? This, yeah, is what, this is what we're working on. Okay. Yes, so because uh, I was just switching around, um, apologies. I think because we were discussing the completion of construction condition, I was opening documents and Zoom, and so it was a Zoom issue. So, so what, what, alas, the, we're on the same page in a lot of ways. So what you see again is the comprehensive permit uh, draft decision, uh, revision date, October 25th. Um, and this is the most up-to-date uh, document that that uh, we should be referring to. And so, um, so apologies if if the incorrect screen sharing um, was uh, indicating a different page uh, for your viewing purposes. So what you see before you uh, is uh, condition 21. I put a suggested strike through. Uh, for the language that is shown here, and I have edited it to provide suggested um, language that says construction shall be completed within 24 months from the issuance of the building permit. Thank you. Ms. Hardy. Uh, I was just going to point out um, that this section, there's, there's a couple of sort of strange numbering um, things and I don't know if that addresses Mr. Langsdale's issue, uh, but I noticed that in section B, um, I think between 12 and 13, yes, this there's a number five. Did you see that? Oh, you're right. Okay, um, uh, so that it is possible that the the numbering scheme became a little 
um, uh, messed up with uh, the, between the drafts. So that's one point. And then the second point, and Mr. Witten can probably address this, but I believe that he might have added a reference to the the actual final plans in this section. Again, I can't, I didn't compare this version to the prior version, but as we were discussing it, I, I seem to have recognized something like that. So those may be the, um, some of the, the ways that the numbering system got a little strange. Okay. So we're at, 21, the, the, what's before the board right now is an amendment to conditions, to condition 21 from the, revi revi the October 25th version. You see it on the, on the board, you see it on the um, screen before you with the following language, construction shall be completed within 24 months. The, is there a second for this amendment to that um, condition? Second. All right. Any further discussion? Just on that condition and that, um, that amendment. If not, the vote occurs on the amendment. It's a roll call vote. I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale. Aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Ms. O'Meara. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. The motion carries. It is amended. Is there any other discussion or amendments to section B, which is utility management conditions? If not, we'll proceed to the next section. It begins with section C and we'll go from condition 22 to condition uh, 33. Condition 22 is all laws and regulations the town of Amherst apply. Condition 23 deals with um, lighting fixtures shall be dark sky compliant. That is also referenced in, we'll get to this later, to another um, condition, which I think we will we'll want to um, merge the two conditions. The um, condition 24, is project plan, this, this provides the building commissioner, 24 provides the building commissioner, the ability to determine if changes from the approved plan is something other than minimal and does not meet either the conditions of A, B, C, A, B or C, which are minor modifications to the plan. And if, if they are not minimal, if he determines that they're not minimal, they come back to the ZBA. That's condition 24. And you see the other areas, specific authorizations for minor changes, two feet in walkways, site perimeters, insubstantial interior exterior changes, and insubstantial interior exchange changes requiring energy uh, to achieve energy efficiency. Condition 25, you've got to comply with um, unmarked human burials. Condition 26, Prior to the authorization of, of this, uh, any activity authorized by the decision, you've got the applicant has to provide the commission with the name, address, and telephone number of the manager. Number 27, uh, again, provides requirements for providing information to the building uh, to the building commissioner before any building permit. So these, and in many ways, these are self-enforcing, but we're putting them here in in the condition. Uh, the condition number 28, the condition logistics plan shall be subject to the following conditions. These are some time restrictions on uh, construction activity. I am assuming that we'll discuss that further. That includes, as, re as it currently reads, restrictions from seven to uh, exterior construction can only happen between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday through Saturday. No idling, no um, noise. It's, you have to have noise attenuation for uh, motors and pneumatic equipment. And in, uh, 
you've got to inform the building commissioner if it's going to be blasting. Uh, 29 imposes um, construction activity. It, has to, it's a, it requires a meeting with the building commissioner. 30 requires the engineer of record to uh, visit the construction site as necessary. 31, uh, no exterior construction activity, including fueling of vehicles on project site before seven or after six, Monday through Saturday. There should be no construction on the project on certain days, the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, et cetera. And the applicant agrees to the hours of operation shall be enforceable by the Amherst police. The project's gotta be fenced. That's 32, 33 is all item efforts should be made to minimize noise on, on Sundays, on Saturdays, excuse me. And we'll stop there and discuss, I think there's a couple of issues within that group of conditions. So discussion regarding Conditions 22 through 33. Okay. There's no discussion. All right. Moving on to the next set of conditions. These also involve, generally involve the um, uh, construction site, site improvements. We'll go from condition 34 to condition 46. 34 requires measures to reduce dust, noise, debris, and construction materials on the site or to contain them. Number 35 deals with the same thing, washing tires, protecting trees, um, bringing every disturbed area back up to finish grade, stabilize um, banks, reduce erosion. 36, um, every night they've got to um, make sure that erosion protection measures are in place. 37, um, a stormwater disposal area should be protected and prevent um, soil compaction by heavy equipment. 38, uh, deals with drainage structures being protected from soil and de debris flow into them during construction. 39, limits uh, stumps and other construction debris from being deposited on the site. This is the, number 40 also deals with exterior lighting as does 23. And I think in, while it's, it's not a problem to have two of them, you know, there may be a way to combine 40 with 23 and just reduce the number of conditions, but I don't wanna get into a numbering thing. So we're just, I'm not gonna suggest that right now. Um, 41, the project shall survive snow storage on the, as shown on project plans, 42, Provide the amenities as shown on project plans, which are included the raised gardens, patios, outdoor tables, chairs, smoking area, equipped with a bench and smoking urn, covered bike storage and lawn areas. Number 43, town engineer shall inspect. Number 44, own property. Um, any town owned property that may be in, impacted by this should be a, a, a surety bond to cover that potential damage. Number 45, within 60 days following the construction, um, the applicant has to show an as-built plan. Again, pretty standard stuff. You gotta show the plan as was actually built with specifics on the size of the, the detail. And 46 uh, says that the final certificate of occupancy shall not be issued for any building or dwelling unit until Top coat of paving, landscaping is done, and as built plans have been submitted. So, is there any discussions, questions, or amendments to conditions 34 through 46? And I don't want to rush people, but if there are none, we'll give it a minute. Mr. Langsdale. Um, I think we need to talk again about the, uh, the smoking area. 
We've had okay. several uh, comments from the public um, wanting, first of all, uh, to be a, a smoke-free area. Um, and then there's uh, one specific one regarding the proposed site. And with, I think, the addition of the photographs, especially the one of the when the football game is on and those kind of weekends where there are tents right up against the fence, uh, which puts the smoking area five feet from five to maybe eight feet from those tents. Um, it's, it's, that's, that's the reason I proposed the area on the uh, northeast uh, corner so that the smoking area would be at least 15 to 20 feet back from the road, over 100 feet from the, ne the next door butter, uh, and not anywhere near the uh, uh, proposed building. Um, and it can be completely screened. It doesn't have to be a pergola or it, it can be a bench and uh, some, you know, surrounded by trees and stuff. Um, I just, I, st I still think that that where, that if it is to be not a smoke-free area, that the positioning of the uh, smoking area now is better for those who are in the building, but not better for uh, uh, the uh, Amherst College activities, uh, with it so close to the property line in that fence. I would, this, th this is something mm -hmm. I would, this is one of the reasons why I talked about the public uh, comments. This is something I would like to hear from the public about if there's anyone who wants to talk about it. Because I, I, I think this is a, I, like Joan with the trees, I, this, the, the, the location of this smoking area, it's, for me is, uh, not good. But we did have we did have a couple of uh, public comments regarding specifically regarding the smoking area, um, and we did have a public comment tonight from one person um, on the uh, on the public comment period, and we've had a couple of comments regarding that from the public. Um, So, Mr. Langsdale, I think what you need to do is to, if that, if you desire to move that, then you would have to have a condition that um, said that the the uh, smoking pavilion shall be located in. Then we will refer back to the um, earlier plan. I, you know, if we had a name for that plan. We'd have to include that in the amendment, which we could do. You know, instruct the staff to include that. But that earlier um, meeting two weeks ago, or, or I guess two meetings ago, we identified an alternate place. I think it was alternate A for the smoking pavilion. So, which you, you probably need an amendment to the conditions to do that. You'd want to add a new condition saying that the, that the smoking pavilion shall be in position X. Is that correct? Uh, yes. And so that would be that the, the place that we scout that we was plotted on an earlier draft on the on the the last draft. Um, showing uh, alternate spaces for the smoking area. Uh, and I think I don't have that. And so I can't give you the right. number, the letter that it was, but it was. But I think I think somebody does have it. OK, Miss Baker. G. All right. G. So G. We can find. So I will stipulate that we can find that um, space, and we can find that specific reference to the, the sheet and space G. So you're you have an amendment that would add a, a requirement that the smoking area be located in space G as defined on to a later to be named page and plan. Correct. Yes. However. Okay. First, yep. I would like to go back even before that, because there was a point in time where uh, the uh, applicants said that they were willing to make it a smoke-free area completely. Um, 
So which one do you want to deal with first? Uh, the smoke free. Okay, so then you have an, do you have a motion regarding that? I make a motion that uh, the uh, entire site of the project be uh, smoke free. Is there a second? Hearing no second, um, there's no motion before the board. All right, then I make a motion that the site for the uh, smoking area be changed uh, from its present location to that uh, of uh, location G on the uh, last revised plans that we saw regarding the smoking areas. Is there a second for Mr. Langsdale's motion? Uh, the motion will fail without a second, will fail to be before the body without a second. Um, the motion fails to be presented to the body for lack of a second. Are there other proposed amendments or changes to conditions uh, 34 through 46? Ms. Pollock. Did you want to... Um clean up 33 versus 40 or combine them? 23 and 40? Or 20, yeah, 20, 23. Yeah. I want to make sure that that's, I, I was going to ask Mr. Langsdale as well if he, if he has a, a, somebody who's definitely interested in that if he has a position on that, but I think we should combine the two. Just so make this, one. Uh, do you want yep, to read it aloud? Um, so uh, so I'll, I'll read aloud. All exterior lighting including pole lights, attached building lighting and pedestrian lighting shall be dark sky compliant and shall be downcast shielded and shall not sign directly onto adjacent properties or streets. All exterior lighting shall be in accordance with the photometric lighting plan, including in the, included with the project plans. And 23 adds lighting fixtures shall be selected according to the dark sky compliance recommendation of the board's rules and regulations. So I would propose that we add 23 to uh, the end of, um, what is it, 40, 40, and just clean it up and have all the, the lighting in one place. Okay. okay. I'm going to make a note to delete this because I think this, if I delete anything, it messes up the numbers. So, yeah, just, just make a um, note that, we'll, that we should do that. Delete, um, delete, let me just do that. Well, delete. the board has to vote on it before we do that, yeah. Maybe delete. So I move we add 23 to the, to the back of 40. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Uh, Mr. Waskevitz. I think it's number 39, if you want to go back to the number, Maureen. So as shown, it's uh, a condition 40. Shown in the red. I'm red looking at the screen. screen. Is everyone okay. seeing, is everyone seeing yes. what I'm seeing? Yep. All right, any other discussion? No further discussion, the vote occurs on the motion. The vote will be a roll call vote. Um, I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Park? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Motion carries five to nothing. Are there any other questions discussions or amendments to 
consider uh, to conditions 34 through 46. Ms. Baker, do you have a question? Um, I have a proposed amendment on number 42 for the board to consider um, where it says raised gardens. If we could say garden areas, um, the presumption that we would invest in raised gardens is based on having tenants who want a garden and we don't know yet if we will. Um, and so our plan is showing spaces where people could garden, um, but we're not gonna put in a lot of raised beds if we don't have tenants who are interested in gardening. I can't imagine that that's gonna be controversial. Um, I move we add the word areas. Is there a second? Second. second. Any discussion? We have to have a roll call vote on this. If there's no further discussion, I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Thank you. Motion, car motion carries five to nothing. All right, we've moved through 34 to 46. Going once, going twice, going three times, we'll move on to the next set of conditions. Landscaping, 47 deals with, it requires it be uh, done in accordance with the plan. 48, um, maintaining landscaping is the plan um, and requires replacement. 49 requires um, to the extent practicable use natural herbicides and non-toxic chemicals. Number 50, all matures trees found within the site uh, except for trees designated in the landscaping plan noted for removal shall remain and be maintained as to provide a visual screening from adjacent properties. Any existing mature, mature tree to remain on the locus that dies following the issuance of this decision will be replaced as follows. And then it requires that a tree be replaced of a similar height. Um, and if a tree was deciduous, it will be replaced with a similar species. So from, are there any, um, Amendments, is there any discussion or is there any amendments to condition 47 through 50 dealing with landscaping? All right, we'll move on to, to um, E, consider items 40, uh, 51 through uh, 55. requires 16 parking places with two of those parking places um, designed as access, designated as accessible. Uh, she'll be, and it shall be um, accessible as through the ADA and the uh, Architectural Access Board. Uh, 52 is, requires eight compact, 53 requires delivery off, um, shall not be off site. I mean, delivery shall not be, shall be conducted off street and on site. You can't block traffic on the, on the street. 55, exterior outlet of the bike facility and 50, 54, exterior outlet of the bike char, uh, charging station and no idling of any vehicles. Um, is there any discussion on 51 through 55? First, let me get the board before we go to the, the applicant, Ms. Hardy, thank you. I do have one one suggestion uh, that we add the words and the management and the parking management plan as submitted to the end of 51. So it would read the project shall include as provided, blah, 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 as provided in the project plans and the management plan and the parking management plan as submitted. Because that, as we got the parking management plan from the uh, applicant it has, contains more detail than the original management plan. Do I have a second for that? Second. Or any, is there any discussion? Is this something that you want to talk about, Ms. Hardy? The subject matter? No, okay. No, uh, right. I have something else. Okay. Um, if there's no further discussion, we'll have a vote on that amendment. The roll call vote. 
I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Park? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Motion carries five to nothing. Um, Ms. Hardy, you had... Uh, Mr. Judge, I noticed a missing word in item 54. I think you want to say the applicant shall provide at least one exterior, exterior uh, electrical outlet within the bike shed. I think that the word shed has been inadvertently left out. Uh, and I think that is a technical and conforming change that does not need a roll call vote. All right. Thank you for that. No problem. Maureen, you can make that change. You're authorized to make that change. Any other questions regarding 51 through 55? All right, we'll move to section F management. We'll deal with conditions 56 through 68. Uh, first one deals with requiring that they live up to the management plan. The second, identifies the areas that the management plan deals with, which includes management, operations, maintenance, marketing, trash recycling, odor mitigation, litter control, off-street parking, site lighting, signage, landscape, snow removal, stormwater management, preventative maintenance, capital needs security, off-street loading and noise mitigation, complaint response procedure, and overall sustainability and healthy operation of the project. 58 says that the applicant shall be responsible for operation for the aspects of the operation. The town accepts no responsibility for provision of any of those so mentioned uh, services. 59 says a part-time manager will be on site during normal business hours, not all business, normal business hours, but during business hours and the typical hours shall be posted in the lobby. That there'll be a 24 hour, seven day a week emergency answering service available for tenants and complaints by the public as set forth in the management plan. 60 deals with the residential services counselor or coordinator position. We reduce that at, pursuant to the discussion at the last meeting from 32 to 27.5 to 30, an average of 27.5 to 30 hours a week. And that those responsibilities of the RCS, RSC would be, uh, are laid out in the Supportive services plan. 61 provides for backup for the resident services counselor. 62 is uh, the residential, that the space in the building is used for the interest of the and benefits of the residents of the project. Um, 63 says you got to require, got to comply with the residential rental pro property bylaw. 64 deals with cameras. 65 refuse and recyclable being set aside. Um, 66 deals requires t tenants to adhere to off street loading and unloading criteria. 67 requires uh, residential leases be a minimum of 12 months and that the lease should be submitted to the board for review and conformance with the requirements of the comprehensive permit. 68 parking for on-site residents and residential visitors shall be managed through a part permitting slash sticker program as described in the parking management plan. Questions, concerns, or amendments to conditions 56 through 68. We'll now deal with Condition 69 through um, 84. First 69 deals with signs. The fire department um, in charge of the uh, applicable seat address and identification units and the construction identification sign shall be as installed as shown on the project plans which we received from the applicant this week. Um, 71 says we've got to meet all building code requirements. 72 says we've got to meet all with the all accessibility codes. 73 says visitors shall be that each unit shall be visitable. That means, you know, able for people with mobility impairments to visit the units. 74 um, allows the 
um, requires the state building plumbing code to be used. 75, uh, the interior of the building shall be smoke free. There's a designated smoking area, an open air pavilion. 76, mechanical equipment is uh, would be screened. 77 is in, in um, enforcement of the parking management plan. Uh, 878 is building service by fully operational elevators. 879 is dwelling units are confined spaces have sprinklers. Windows have to be open in 8081 is um, demolition of existing structures and shown in the demo demolition project plan. 80, um, 82, the applicant uh, shall work with the fire department to get a Knox box. Inspection services shall have responsibility for assigning address and units numbers. And 84 is the applicant shall pre present the details for all proposed fuel storage to the fire department and obtain the fire department's approval. Any question, comments, or amendments to condition 69 through 84? Okay, I had I had none. Looks like we don't have any from anybody else. So we'll deal with conditions eighty five through eighty nine. Eighty five is the comprehension permit shall not be transferred without the approval from the board. And um, any proposal to transfer or assign shall be deemed a substantial change, and that means it's got to come back to us. 86 deals with uh, providing supportive services for at least the initial stabilization period. 87 deals with the tenant selection process shall be presented to the board uh, for the board's approval. 88 um, says any slope has to be that finished grade in excess of the natural angle, but no slope can be in excess of the natural angle of repose when finished. And 89 is all filled areas that were not built upon within one year upon completion of the operation shall be covered by four inches of loam and brought up to finished grade mulched and um, seated in a satisfactory manner. Are there any questions, comments, or amendments to 85 through 89? First, I want to get anybody from the board, Ms. Hardy, before we go to the applicant. I have one comment um, when we get on number 86. I think it's great that, that the um, applicant shall coordinate services for the initial stabilization period. But in the supportive services plan, I think you talked about having um, services available after that if, if tenants, um, especially tenants in the homeless preference units requested or needed them and that you'd be available that the residents, one of the job of the resident service, residence services counselor would, or um, person would be to help provide that. And so what I wanted to do to my suggestion is that we add the words at the end of that um, first sentence. And, and at the end of the initial stabilization period shall offer supportive services, shall offer continued supportive services from service providers. So what I'm trying to get at is that it doesn't end at 12 months to the extent that there are people in the homeless preference units that could benefit from additional services and they ask you for them, it would be good if you would, at the end of the initial stabilization period, let them know that those services are available. And then it's up to them to whether or not they can, whether or not they want to avail themselves of those units, of those uh, services. Could you just repeat that, uh, sure. that, that quote? Yep. That let me edit. try it again. So after the word occupancy, before the sentence, before the period, add, and at the end of the initial stabilization period shall offer continued support from service providers. So it requires the applicant to coordinate support in the first six to 12 months and in the same, th same way offer that to people at the end of the initial stabilization period. Comment from Ms. Baker and, Ms. and then Ms. Hardy. I think we're on the same page, just a semantic thing. So yep. the resident service coordinator 
coordinate services. They don't right. do direct clinical services. Right. So um, that we would, after the stabilization period, we shall continue to offer um, coordination of social service social services. Right. It says that I'm just adding an additional period to the end that at the end of the initial stabilization period shall offer or so continue to offer support from service providers. Coordination of right. support from service providers. Yeah. Offer coordination of support. Shall offer yeah. coordination of support. Okay. That's awesome. Thank All you. All right. Instead of continued. Ms. Hardy. I was going to make the same point that Ms. Baker just made, um, okay. but I also wanted to bring to the board's attention an issue with item 85 when you're ready to talk about that. All right. So, sorry, just if I'm hearing you correctly. So at the end of that sentence, it would say, and at the end of the uh, initial stabilization period, the applicant shall provide, shall provide, can, shall provide continued coordinated support services, uh, con continued, co sorry. No, you, you, can continue. you, can, okay, you can take out continued. Okay, continued. You can take out continued and shall offer coordinated support from service providers. Okay, I got it. Yep, thank you. Yep, same. So I move that we amend condition 86 as just described. If we need to see that on, uh, if people need to see that on paper, we can probably draft it up. Do I have a second? Second. Any further, any discussion on the motion to amend condition 86? If not, the vote occurs on the motion. Uh, it's a roll call vote. I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Motion is unanimous. Five to nothing, it's unanimous, and the motion carries. Ms. Hardy, you had a question, you had a suggestion. Yes, Mr. Judge, thank you. Um, so, um, on item 85 um, that prohibits Valley uh, or applicant um, from transferring or assigning the comprehensive permit, it is almost certain that uh, as part of the financing, Valley CDC is going to be forming a single purpose entity um, to own uh, the project. Um, that entity will among other th things, receive the low-income housing tax credits, which is the sort of the key piece of the financing for this project. So I would like to um, ask that the board consider some language. And I, I think I had offered some in a prior yeah. draft, which I'm not sure if it got to Maureen or not. So my it apologies did. if it did, but um, I think we ought to add a, um, exception to this non trans this non assignment clause that contemplates that we are going to be assigning the comp permit to the entity that is going to be formed to actually own the project and receive the financing just reading the i'm going over the existing condition right now Mr. Chairman, yes, Mr. Witten. If, if this is if this is helpful, that that's a perfectly acceptable uh, suggestion. And so, what the board might consider is, with the sole exception being the sole exception of permitting the transfer of this comprehensive permit to a single purpose entity, uh, then continue this comprehensive permit shall not be transferred or assigned. So, if if the board is comfortable with that, which is uh, that, that is certainly acceptable. Uh, you mm -hmm. could carve out that singular exception. All right, Maureen, do you have that? I think so. Okay, so can you read it back to us? I think we just, I think John is suggesting we just add words at the beginning is that, of the sentence, is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chairman, yes. Yeah. 
Actually, Attorney Witten, could you? Sure, could you absolutely. Ab of course, Maureen. With the sole exception of the transfer of this comprehensive permit to a single purpose entity established by Valley CDC, comma, this comprehensive permit, and then continue from there, Maureen. Sure. Okay. All right, thank you. I move we amend condition 85 as um, described by John, um, by, by Mr. Witten, um, and as um, written by Ms. Pollock to add words at the beginning of 85. Is, is there a second? Good. Discussion, anybody have any questions about what's being proposed? It's suitable to the applicant? Works yes, that works yep. fine, Mr. Judge. Yep. Thanks very much. Good. Any further discussion? If not, vote occurs on the motion to amend condition 85. I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Motion carries five to nothing. Thank so you. amended. Any other condition, any other amendments, discussions about conditions 85 through 89? So we, we've reached the end of the conditions that are set before us. If there are other conditions that members of the board wish to propose at this time, this is the time to do that. You don't have to, I mean, you, you don't have to uh, have it relate to the um, the last miscellaneous provisions or other provisions uh, and other conditions, but this is the time to add any additional conditions or to amend any of the conditions that we've dealt with. Catch all provision opportunity for everybody. All right. The um, The motion before the next order of business is to approve the conditions as amended tonight's meeting. So I move that we approve the conditions as amended by tonight's um, board meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Now is discussion on the conditions. And the motion to approve those conditions. Mr. Chairman, might I just add, uh, and I apologize if I'm interrupting anyone's uh, question, if, if as part of the board's motion, if the board would grant permission to staff, and that would include me, uh, to make any uh, Scrivener's errors or other insignificant non-substantial changes between when the board votes and when the board executes the decision, I think that would be very helpful. Yep. That's a good catch, John. So I would amend my motion to um, authorize staff to make technical and conforming changes and any correct any Scrivener's errors um, between now and when the, the, the decision is filed. Uh, Mr. Chair, procedurally, yes. we need to second that amendment and then vote on the Yep, oh, I thought I had a second, but I, I probably could have been any of the other votes, but I need a second, I guess. Mr. Maxfield, do, you ha do I have one? Second it. <laughs> All right, good. I've had a lot of seconds tonight. I can't, <laughs> I forgot whether I had one for this or not. All right, discussion on it. All right, if there's no further discussion, the motion occurs, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the conditions with authorization for staff to make technical and conforming 
and Scrivener's changes um, to the conditions uh, between now and the um, filing of the document. Roll call vote is required. I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale. Aye. Ms. O'Meara. Aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Yeah. All right. Uh, motion is unanimous. The uh, conditions are approved. So I would like to get the consensus of the board. Um, do we feel we're ready to make a decision on the, the final decision on the application tonight? I don't think there's been significant enough. I don't think there's been significant enough changes to the document that we need to um, have the document amended, sent back to us, and have an open and continue the meeting till and have another vote on this. I think we have gone through the, the changes, the amendments. I think we've, in most cases, identified the exact language we want to use, and we've authorized the staff to fix any technical and conforming um, mistakes that were made. Um, so I'm ready to proceed, but I want to make sure that the rest of the board is comfortable before we do that. And if somebody isn't, it's a good. This is a good point to uh, raise the question. So then, what the next motion will be to close the public hearing on uh, ZBA 2020 and move to then. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Maureen. Ms. Ms. Brestrup is raising her hand. Oh, Ms. Brestrup, I didn't see. Yes. I just wondered if you had any intention of allowing any further public comment because that had been brought up by Mr. Langsdale um, earlier in the meeting. Oh, we do have one. I was been observing here. We do have one request for public hearing. This is the last opportunity for it. So um, it's a good catch. Ms. Pam. Ms. Brestrup, I forgot it. Ms. Pam. Um, hello, I'm quite confused about the matter of the staffing. I thought that uh, through, through all the public hearings that we had, that it was agreed upon that between 27 and 35 hours, and I think it's down to 27 now, of, of a coordinator, a person, a person on site was gonna be there. But it sounds tonight as if that's only for the initial six to 12 months. And I, I think the statement, unless people ask for it is very weak. Uh, people who need help often don't ask for it, but they need help. And it, this is assuming that people come in and that nobody moves, there's no changeover, and that you get a bunch of people and they come in and then they stay there for 10 years. But I don't think that's how it's going to be. So I, I was pretty, I saw that you were trying to pin the language down a little bit, but it just, that could be interpreted as a way to just walk out and just say, okay, we've done it, we've adjusted, it's over and now we don't have to have this person here anymore. And then the thing that the community fought very hard for that condition. And it seems as if now it's just gonna be a will of the wisp. So I, I'm not happy about that. I had no problems with anything else that you were discussing tonight. It was all practical and uh, things that you've talked about and things you had to do and had to deal with. But this is the topic that people that stop me in the street uh, and talk about and email me about. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about it. Ms. Pam, if I might respond, I think there's a couple of things. Number one, um, they will be required to have a res, an RSC on staff on campus between 20, for an average of between 27 and 30 hours a week. That will continue for the length of the program. So that will be there. Um, they also, if a client comes and um, comes in, there's a, the initial stabilization period for a person that they offer them, they offer them uh, services during that initial stabilization period. The amendment we had tonight said they also have to continue to offer that at the end of the initial stabilization period and make it a, make those services available to that client. Um, for the rest of their for the rest of their tenancy, they can co they can coordinate those services. They won't provide the services themselves, but the service providers that they contract with or who are following that client from the um, when they were uh, assigned or when they were um, became a, a tenant 
will continue to provide services if the client chooses to have those services during the entire tenancy, if they choose. I think that's right. Is it not, Ms. Baker, or did I mis misinterpret yeah. it? Because I, I agree with Ms. Pam's concern. I think it's sure. that sure. we want I services think... to people who want services as long as sure. the building is there. I think the issue is people are hearing the discussion, but they may not see everything that's written down. So I'm going to read um, the relevant section uh, to address Ms. Pam's question. So it says, this is a condition that was just voted on. The resident services coordinator position shall be employed pursuant to a written contract for an average of 27 and a half to 30 hours per week. In no week shall there be less than 25 hours of employment for the resident services coordinator. Uh, the responsibilities of the resident services coordinator shall be as described in the approved supportive services plan. Um, the responsibilities, duties, and hours of the resident services coordinator shall not be substantially changed without approval of the board. And the next uh, section says, the applicant shall provide for qualified backup coverage in the case of absence of the resident services coordinator. So I think because we had reviewed this at the prior meeting, it wasn't something we went over line by line tonight. Um, but I think that's the key um, condition that relates to the um, concern that Ms. Pam was raising. Um, can I follow up briefly? Yes, Ms. Pamp. Okay. Um, I teach at Holyoke Community College, and I'm teaching remotely. And um, I notice there's a great difference. I, my, I, my students are coming to my classes, even 8 o'clock, and all that is going well. They're doing their work. But when I was on campus and in an office during certain periods of the week, people dropped by. People came in. And in the course of conversation, um, I would discover they would share problems that they were having. But now that they have to e email me um, or speak up at the end of the Zoom meeting to say, can I speak to you privately or whatever, they're not doing that. So I just think there's a great value in having somebody on site um, just so that people walk by, that the clients walk by and they say, oh, I'll just ask this first, ask her about that for the informal kind of interchange. Um, but if it's when it's requesting service, we all know that we don't like to ask for help. And um, if we have to make a big to do about it, we don't do it. So I, I just hope that there'll be uh, the on site service coordinator will be preserved, perhaps with changes, but still continue on site hours, even if nobody has formally requested that. Yes, they will. If I may, Ms. Pam, yes, they will. They're, they're going to. They have 30 hour average of 30 hours a week. They'll be performing services, uh, performing their, their functions. And we laid out those, the responsibilities for the, the coordinator are pretty well laid out and pretty detailed. And mm -hmm. I think um, in viewing them and getting information from other sources uh, regarding what is typical in supportive housing settings, we have a very, very robust um, offering of services and personnel dedicated to providing that on to uh, 10 and maybe more clients, but at least to 10 clients. Um, so the services are pretty, are extremely robust as far as these kinds of houses, uh, units are concerned. And I, and they are, will be provided there in on site, and, coordinated there on site, excuse me. And to add, if the applicant, you know, in the future wishes to reduce the amount of hours or the roles of responsibilities, that would be a modification of, of the comprehensive permit, which uh, would require um, the ZBA review and approval. Yep. Sounds good. Yep. So uh, the board the board felt really strongly about that as well, just like it sounds like you do as well. The board felt very strongly about that. Thank you. Are there other public comments? Okay. If there are no public comments, no further comments from members of the board. I move that we, uh, the vote occurs on the motion, which is to close a public hearing on ZBA 2020, the Valley Community Development Corporation located at 132 Northampton Road. I think I had a second, did I not Dylan? <laughs> If not, I'm giving you a second now. I think I already did, but if I got one now, 
All right. Is there any discussion on the motion to close the public hearing? If not, the vote occurs on the motion to, oh, I just would say one thing. By closing this public hearing, we start the clock, which is from this, we have 14 days from closing this hearing. Is that right? Or is it 40 days? There's no, clock Mr. That Chair, starts. Yep. Mr. Chairman, 40 days from the close of the hearing, and then yep. 14 days to record your decision once you vote. Got it. So we have, this causes us to, to um, and you, you're, you're able to meet that, are you not, Maureen? If you're not, let us know. No, I, I am. Uh, right. Well, I, Attorney uh, Witten, are we? Yes, we are. All right. Perfect. So we're starting the clock and um, by doing this. All right. The vote is a roll call vote. I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale. Aye. Ms. O'Meara. Aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. The vote is five ayes and zero nays. The motion is approved. The public hearing on the comprehensive permit is now closed. We now move to the public meeting consideration of the comprehensive permit. As you know, the public meeting is when the board deliberates and is generally not a time for public comment or comment from the applicant. So I would put the, the motion before the board. I move that the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals approves a comprehensive permit, ZBA 2020, Valley Community Development Corporation, located at 132 Northampton Road, as described in the decision document, as amended, approved by the board earlier this evening at its public hearing. The materials referenced in that approved decision document, the revised permit plan set dated 10-22-2020, and the parking management plan. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. Park seconds the motion. Is there any discussion on the motion to approve the comprehensive permit? Okay. If there is no further discussion, the roll call occurs on the vote. I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. The vote is five ayes and zero nays. The motion is approved. The comprehensive permit is approved. Um, and before we move on to the last part of this of the meeting, which is a public comment portion of the meeting that we have, I just want to compliment Valley CDC for their work in putting together this application. It responds to an urgent need in our town for affordable housing that really has to be met. And um, this is a good project to do that. The town will be well served by the success of this project and we appreciate it. I also want to thank the community for their involvement. Um, many people were engaged in this project long before we were engaged at the ZBA, the town council, working with you, bringing the valid CDC into the town. Um, that's public, that's staff, that's everybody. Um, and they, they really deserve a lot of credit. And I want them, the public to know that the comments that they provided us really did inform our decision and it made it a better decision. So we appreciate that. Next, I wanna compliment our outside counsel, John Witten. Thank you very much for the work you've done uh, and, for, and for the work the law done at the law firm, KP Law Firm. And lastly, I wanna compliment the uh, town staff, Chris Brestrup, Rob Mora, Dave Waskevich, and especially Maureen Pollock, who spent her last four months doing all things 40B. Um, she's been consumed by that even more than we have. And um, I don't think this board has ever, this group of members have ever had a comprehensive permit before with the exception of Keith Langsdale. Who's, had, who's done one of these before. But I don't think we could have done it without all your work, Maureen, or with all, without all the work of the town staff. So thank you very much. Applause to you guys, great job. Um, thank you all. And lastly, thanks to my, the other members of the board. Um, each and every one of you contributed, each and every one of you did a lot to help this uh, get done on time. Uh, and I think we all made it a better application. Uh, so thank you to Keith, to Joan, to Tammy, to Dylan, and to Sharon, who was always standing um, ready if we needed her at every one of these meetings, even though we didn't hear from her. So all of you, thank you, thank you very much. You did a great job, I appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank You're you welcome. so much to the board members and staff. Mr. Maxfield, you have your hand up. 
I, I, I do. I just have to say, uh, I, echo you, I echo all of your thank yous, but I, I have to say a big thank you to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you took on the role of chair with a uh, pretty green new board with uh, a lot of experience here and then jumping right into a comprehensive permit. Uh, I can't say it's necessarily an enviable position, but uh, you did really a great job at, at leading the team here. So I, uh, I thank you for that uh, very much so. Very kind. I couldn't have done it without you guys. You made it easy. Thank you all. Thank you, Steve. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Congratulations Chairman. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you. Last order of business is public comments before the on any matter that's not before the board tonight. Um, is there any, Maureen, do we have anybody who, um, yes, we, looks like we have somebody with their hand up, Ms. Greenbaum. I just wanna say, and this is related to tonight, I think you should go crack a few bottles of champagne. It's been a <laughs> long haul. Worse for me, I think. Here, here anyway, go that. enjoy, go celebrate. <laughs> something good you know this is if i may respond to that miss greenbaum if it wasn't for the damn pandemic i think i'd be buying everybody a favorite drink at a local watering hole and we would celebrate but um i guess we'll have to wait till we can all meet you, in the can, bar you can celebrate six feet apart <laughs> <laughs> we could all right well thank you all Congratulations, you all did a great job. I appreciate all your help. And we, are, uh, we look forward to this wonderful project and um, we look forward to the help of the other town. Thank you. Um, Good night, everybody. One thing, um, unfortunately, the show goes on, the ZBA continues. <laughs> so the next, um, next meeting is uh, November 12th. Um, and so I'll be sending out an email for non 40B projects. An and is that at 6 30? It is at moment? okay. So um, 6 30 on November 12th is the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Maxfield, did you have your hands raised? You, I was going to now make the motion to adjourn. <laughs> All right. Is there a second? <laughs> Ms. Parks, is there is there any discussion on the motion to adjourn? Actually, you can't discuss the motion to adjourn. That's the whole point of it. But the, motion, the, the vote occurs on the motion to adjourn. All, um, it's a roll call vote. I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale. Aye. Ms. O'Meara. Aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Motion carries five to nothing. It's unanimous. Motion is adjourned. All right, good night, folks.